Um, going into a, a network role, I um, uh, did a, a long stint as a security researcher, uh, most recently at WebSense before that, and then ended up as one of the early uh, application security uh, employees at Facebook. And one of the, when I had arrived at Facebook, I had already had a pretty miserable set of experiences with responsible disclosure and vulnerability coordination over the, the course of my career before that. And one of the first things that I helped set up at Facebook was a formalization of a responsible disclosure program, um, which was us just coming out and saying, um, we're not going to be jerks to security researchers. We want to work with you properly. Um, we'd like to have a process in place for, for measuring that. And we ran with just a responsible disclosure program for three or four years um, before we kind of naively decided to start offering bounties. We were the second web property uh, on the internet to start paying cash to researchers, um, and it was pretty overwhelming. Uh, we were uh, uh, feeling pretty confident going into it, hadn't had uh, uh, too many problems that were cropping up. We thought we were doing our jobs pretty well. Uh, we announced cash bounties on the, the night before DEF CON uh, Friday, and uh, receive more vulnerabilities in the next 48 hours than the teams, all of our tooling and internal pen tests had found over the last year. Uh, we stayed very busy, it was a very humbling experience, um, but it started think, us thinking a lot about how we operationalize our responsible disclosure program and then later the bug bounty program. Um, fast forward a few years from that and uh, I founded and now run the uh, product and engineering teams for a company called HackerOne. Which, as a, the topic of this talk, I need to give a, a brief intro of, of what HackerOne does and how some of the metrics that we're going to be talking about today were, were collected. Um, our core use case at HackerOne is to enable a security at. We call this vulnerability coordination, and HackerOne at its core is a vulnerability coordination platform. There's a lot of different names for this in the, in the industry. You just heard me using responsible disclosure, which is what we call the program at, at Facebook. I'm still a little partial to that term, even though there are very good reasons not to use emotionally labeled uh, descriptors for what we're talking about here. Uh, more commonly, you'll hear it called vulnerability coordination or vulnerability disclosure. But we simply refer to it as security at. This is as simple as setting up security at yourcompany.com and having a clear defined process for researchers to contact you with potential vulnerabilities that they've identified. We host about 500 of these ongoing programs now at this point. A, a little over 2,000 individual hackers have disclosed vulnerabilities to our customers through this process. And there's been over 17,000 of those vulnerabilities, uh, unique vulnerabilities identified in those 500 companies uh, connected into this. I need to do a little bit of, of a caveat here in, in that this is a point that I like to hit on pretty regularly. We are simply a platform. Uh, our customers do not grant us access to their vulnerability information. Um, none of what we look at analyzes content. We're strictly looking at transaction data here, the state of bug reports, and helping measure how that correlates against um, everything else. Um, the programs that are being run on HackerOne are being run by the customers and companies that offer those programs. It's a direct relationship with, uh, with the researchers. And finally, we're coming up on about $6 million in bounties paid by our customers back to the security research community. And it's important to note that a bug bounty is optional and discretionary. Not all of our customers do it. A huge chunk of them do not. And it's helpful to think about why those companies do or do not choose to offer incentives in particular areas, which brings us to the topic that we're going to talk about today. This is the question that I hope we'll have a little bit easier time answering at, at the end of this. I want to uh, caveat a little bit about the audience and who I think this will be more useful to. Um, I'm specifically talking to folks who are running some type of product or service that is externally accessible over the internet or in someone's physical possession. Um, the areas of your security and infrastructure that are not internet accessible or um, directly exposed to the outside um, or probably not, if, if you're not responsible for any infrastructure like that, um, you probably aren't asking yourself this question. Uh, additionally, um, if you're already running a bug bounty program, then you've already answered this question and you're probably not going to get a lot out of this talk. Um, sorry about that. Um, there's also a lot more that we can talk about about bug bounty programs. So I'm going to assume here that people are generally familiar with the concept um, and we're going to specifically focus on just that initial question of do I offer incentives in this particular area, yes or no? Um, and we're defining a bounty here as a monetary incentive offered in exchange for a vulnerability report. There are a number of different ways that you can go about answering this question. There is no simple 
one surefire path for this. Not all technology stacks are created equal. This is not one size fits all. There's a little bit of analysis that needs to go into um, whether or not this makes sense, and it's a little bit subjective at the end of it. Um, but there's two methods that I found work the best. There's other ones that we can talk about, but I'm just most of the time talking about just these two. The first one is, look at the data that's coming out of your security app program. Uh, hopefully you've received a vulnerability report from somebody in the past, and what that process looks like, you should be measuring how that is going, and you will learn a tremendous amount from that process. It's kind of uh, nice that Marcus warmed us up with uh, metrics and stats this morning, uh, because I'm going to be reiterating that. This, the best way to answer the question is to get a very tight control over the metrics and stats that are being generated by your security program, particularly those vulnerabilities that are coming from the outside. One of the first dimensions that is critical for all of us to pay attention to is around vulnerabilities. There's a lot of different ways to slice this. Um, we can talk a little bit later about how HackerOne slices this for the customers that are there, um, but you don't need a platform like that to be able to start answering this question for yourself. It's important to start measuring the total number of vulnerabilities that are coming in from a particular source. We're gonna just be talking about those external vulnerabilities here, vulnerabilities that were found by the outside, not by your team. Um, and then breaking them down by type and severity is, is equally relevant. Um, and for your particular area, you, you'll know your application far better than, uh, than I ever will or, the, or this platform will. And there's going to be additional metrics here that will point towards whether or not um, how the overall health of your vulnerabilities are looking. And the important thing to ask when you're asking yourself, should you bounty, is, is this trending down? If you look at your vulnerabilities for a period, period previous period of time for a particular application or service, even a specific product or service, and it's going up. If you open up your Qualys, Qualys dashboard every month and you look at each quarter and there's more and more red every single time, you do not want a bounty program yet for that. You need an SDL and a lot more investment in your SDL before you're ready to start looking at that product or service. Hopefully not everything in your environment looks like this. There's going to be areas that are better off and worse off, and a bounty is not one size fits all across the organization. But you wanna to try to narrow it down to those specific areas where your vulnerabilities have trending down. You're looking for places where all your existing security tooling and automation and investment in the past has started to produce diminishing returns. You had amazing results from a penetration test the first time you ran one 10 years ago, and you're looking at it in the past time and it's started to trend down a little bit to the point where you're, you're not running them as aggressively in that particular area. Secondly, since we're talking about external vulnerability reports, the, ne the next dimension that we like to pay attention to is, is hackers. Um, we call them security researchers, um, vendors, uh, the outside, wherever it is, have some metric of how many vulnerabilities have been reported to us or we learned about through somebody that wasn't on our payroll or wasn't on our staff. Uh, most importantly, tracking just the total number, the total number of new individuals for per particular time period. If you look at the, how many times were we contacted for the very first time by an individual per quarter, um, most importantly, the number of repeat hackers that are coming back. This is the sole metric that MSRC, MSRC optimized their process for in measuring whether or not the MSRC security app was effective. They wanted to pay attention to how many one-hit wonders did we have. How many times did somebody send us a vulnerability and then disappear, never be heard from again? And by focusing on that one single metric and optimizing for that, they made tremendous strides in the MSRC and started to identify areas where um, they needed to improve upon uh, their, their overall process. But should you bounty, if we're asking ourselves that question, you're looking for metrics here that are trending down. You want to have heard from less hackers this quarter than you heard from last quarter. You want to particularly pay attention to the ones that are only reporting high and critical vulnerabilities. If you happen to have a product or service where you are getting a consistent regular number of high and critical vulnerabilities from the researchers without giving them any type of incentives, it's probably not an ideal candidate for let's go bounty that area. And again, we're looking for particular products and services, not necessarily the entire application scope here. Third, since we're talking about there's two parties involved here, you need to have a very 
good handle on what your response efficiency looks like. This is gonna be defined differently at every single organization and hopefully you already have some type of instant response metric of how long does it take us to fix X. Um, the ones that we pay attention to at HackerOne are the mean time to respond, the mean time to triage, and the mean time to resolve the, the incident. Um, this is a very subjective area. There's no clean answer for what this should look like for everybody. Uh, but you should generally try to ask yourself, are, are you happy with these metrics? If you look at them and you're like, yeah, feel, feel pretty good about that one, do not feel good about that one. And one way to think about that is how many of those vulnerabilities took longer than N days to resolve? And N is going to be different for every single product line. There are products where a perfectly reasonable value for N is 180 days. And there are product lines where a reasonable value for N is 18 hours. And you don't know the difference until you have started to measure your baseline, trended it over time, and are paying attention to how long should it take us to resolve here. And the litmus test that I like to use for this is if you set an internal SLA for it, we want to resolve all vulnerabilities in X in N hours, would you be comfortable talking about it publicly? Is it, would, would you feel proud about it? Would it feel good? Would it be something that you'd be comfortable talking about? Not necessarily that you have to, it's just that's the, the a frame of mind that I like to get in when trying to assess is it, uh, do we have a response efficiency here that we're happy with? So the way that we approach this at Hacker One is based on that realization that this isn't one size fits all. There are many different type of product and services out there that come from, have a number of different circumstances that um, we can't possibly account for in our, our metrics. So we devised a success index that measures key aspects of the security app performance across a number of different dimensions. But most importantly, the technique that we use benchmarks trends here against all the other organizations on, on the HackerOne platform. So we're not trying to answer this by, is this a good metric uh, for you? You're the only person who can answer that question and we'll certainly show you the raw, the raw data and encourage you to collect the raw data. Um, but the one that we highlight the most is, how does this compare to other organizations that look like you? Either through public avail available data or um, uh, data that's available on the platform. It's one of the most um, objective ways of identifying whether or not a particular metric is good or trending in the right direction is by looking around at, at peers and looking what industry best practices are. There are six distinct but pretty tightly connected uh, dimensions that we, that we monitor and pay attention to here. And we've, we've touched on three of them and some of the inputs that you could use in your own program to uh, start collecting similar uh, dimensions. But the first one is, is vulnerabilities. You need to understand are your vulnerabilities going up or are they going down and in what areas are they going up or going down. We break hackers out into two dimensions. The first one is breadth, which is the number of the range of hackers and particularly the range of skills of hackers that you're, that you're attracting. Even if you have a large number of hackers, if those hackers are only reporting cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, you do not have a great hacker breadth. And we can talk a little bit more about what that, that means in a second, but we're trying to capture here, do you have a diverse skill set across, uh, um, uh, across the external finders that you have? So I think we're looking at hacker debt. This answers the MSRC question of how many one-hit wonders do we have? How many people are sending us one vulnerability to never be heard from again? Is that a good thing or, or a bad thing? Are they not coming back because there simply are no more vulnerabilities? Or this, was, this exhausted their skill set? Or they were unhappy about something in the process and decided that it wasn't a, a positive experience for them or wasn't worth their time? Or w whatever it was, there's a range of things that goes into here. But this is something that we encourage our customers to pay attention to because repeat hackers get far more effective over time and we see the most successful programs that we have do have a loyal set of security researchers that they hear from on a regular cadence. And finally, re response efficiency. And this, again, um, everyone has different uh, SLAs that they like to stick to here and different definitions of what quality are, but it's something that you should at least be paying very close attention to so that you can know if it's getting better or worse and how to improve it. Finally, there's two other ones that we're not gonna talk about today. One is on reward competitiveness, how competitive is your bounty, uh, assuming you've already answered this question, uh, and the, the second one is signal ratio. So there's a number of ways that we visualize this. Uh, this is a, uh, I love that Marcus said that anyone who shows you a pie chart is lying to you, uh, and I'm, I'm lying to you right now, even though this isn't a pie chart, it's a, it's a spider chart, uh, but this is a point in time snapshot of those six different dimensions plotted against the average enterprise uh, which is the, uh, the red box in the middle 
Um, the blue box is the example program that we're talking about here. Uh, this is a, a real anonymized live program from, from HackerOne. Um, and what, to, to really make the most of this, you need to trend this over time. You need to know what this looked like last month and the month before. But for our example, we're taking a point inside snapshot and trying to answer the question, should I offer a bounty here? So if we break this down into the individual uh, dimensions that we're looking at, on, on the vulnerabilities fixed side, um, it's pretty good, a little bit above average. If you look at the average enterprise from their external finders, they're getting about that many vulnerabilities coming in, normalized across the, across the entire data set in a, in a weighted average. If we look at the researcher breadth, they're also doing quite well. They're getting a range of researchers, a, a, a larger number of them than they're in the industry average, and they're getting a diverse set of skills coming out of here, meaning there's multiple uh, uh, backgrounds and skill sets and different creative views on the problem being leveraged on it. And, and finally, their response efficiency is, is above industry average. They're doing much better here than, than their peers are. So if we, if we try to take a step back and, and capture this, we do see that there's this massive chunk missing on the, on the reward competitive side. And I don't mean to paint that as a bad thing. If we, they're just not offering any type of financial incentive for the reporting of a security vulnerability now. But they're clearly doing something right in that they're getting above average responses on every other metric. So if we ask ourselves the question, should this organization or, or this product offer a bug bounty program? Is it time to bounty this? Would anybody bounty it? Probably not. Like there's, there's still room for improvement. You could get up to a 10 on vulnerabilities found, but if you're still getting vulnerabilities for free and you're getting a, a wide range of researchers and the repeat customers, your value in offering a bounty is not going to be as strong as it could be. And there are probably other investments in your, in your SDL or your team or your security program that are going to be a better return than, than offering a bounty. Um, but all of this starts with collecting this and getting a sense of how do I feel about response efficiency, how are my vulnerabilities trending, and how many external researchers am I engaging with. Um, and ideally, you can use some type of benchmarking, around, but even if you don't have the benchmarking capability, you can answer this and assess whether or not you're relatively happy about it, particularly by looking at how this is trending. If you pay attention to this over time, you can get a very good sense of are we getting more finders or fewer finders than we did in the past. And it helps to uh, answer that. If we take a second example here, this is another live program on HackerOne that is a, a Security app program, no, no bounties offered yet. If we look at their vulnerabilities fixed, they're, they're still getting value here, but it's right around average. It's not, it's not terrible. Um, you're still getting vulnerabilities from the outside being identified and responsibly disclosed to the, to the security team. Um, but if we look at the, the researcher breadth, there's not a, not a great distribution here. It's a relatively small number of finders with a finite set of skills, and they're not fully attracting the diversity of backgrounds and experience and expertise that would show the most value in these programs and help get that one up. But on, critically, on the good note, they're a very responsive program. They are responding quickly, resolving issues quickly, um, and their response efficiency looks pretty good. So I'll pose the same question again, even though it's probably spoiled at this point. <laughs> would you offer a bounty here? starts to look a little bit better. You're feeling good about your response time. You're not engaging a, hard, a large number of researchers. You have some amount of emphasis on um, upward movement on both the depth and the vulnerabilities fixed. Um, and this is a perfect candidate for offering bounties will probably drive those other three metrics higher. It's a little bit more nuanced than, than, than that, but you can look at something like this and say, if we offered bounties, um, we are probably going to get significantly better than we were getting before. And there's a really interesting topic of conversation that I'm going to uh, not spend a ton of time diving into today, is how come some organizations end up like this and some end up like this? There's a range of factors that go into that, both from the complexity of the challenge presented, the uh, amount of credibility that they get, the response efficiency, how respectful you are to them, um, how sexy it is to, to hack your particular product. Um, and that's just, the reality is that not everything is created equal, and some organizations have to bounty sooner than others simply because they're not getting that external attention um, that some companies just get rather naturally. Uh, but trying to understand that is the, is the first 
uh, stage of doing that. So you might be looking around and think you have a problem with number one. And if you are gonna have a problem with number one, how many people have a clear channel for a security researcher to send a vulnerability report to them? If I've got a vulnerability report and I need to send it to that company, there's an obvious way to do it. It's good. It's good. Usually you don't get that many hands coming up. We've got some uh, advanced folks in the room here. Um, and so if you're not already doing that, I would have a biased answer to you and to say, before you start asking yourself the question, do we bounty or do we not bounty, focus on answering the question, how come we just don't have a security ad inbox that we monitor and a process for reporting vulnerabilities to us? Um, does anyone want to volunteer an answer as to why they don't do that yet? Internet access, you have an internet accessible product or service and no way for vulnerability to be reported. Yeah, you don't know what the response time is gonna look like. Um, even if you're not offering cash incentives, you're going to get something from the outside and measuring that to start with is, is kind, of a, kind of a big first step. But you're not gonna be able to do num method number one unless you have this guy. You, you, you need data, you need to understand your metrics, you need to know what is coming into your program and what people are finding in order to, to do it. And one of the big fallacies that I worry about, I, I'm a huge proponent of, of responsible disclosure. It's something that I've been advocating for for a long time. And there's a big fallacy that, oh, if no one's reported a vulnerability to us or we don't get that many, there's just nobody finding them and there's none of them out there. The reality is that if you do not have a clear process for reporting it, there is a huge amount of anxiety in the mind of the individual before they go to submit it to you. Um, are they going to sue me? Am I sending it to the right place? Am I using the right process? Um, am I doing something wrong? Um, is this worth my time? And the answer unequivocally, if you haven't said, here's where you send security vulnerability reports, is a very, very painful experience for the researcher and they are far more likely to just sit on that vulnerability and do nothing, regardless of how they found it. This isn't about giving permission to hack stuff or, um, uh, asking people to, to pen test your service for free, just no questions asked. If you found a vulnerability, where does it go? And if you haven't answered that question yet in your organization, I would state that it's a pretty heavy prerequisite to answering the question of should you offer a bounty or not. I'm gonna go off a bit of a tangent here in that the industry is currently in a pretty sad state. We get this question from researchers all the time. It's like, hey, I use this product, um, I was signing up as I normally do and I put a back tick in my name and I think I just found remote code execution. Uh, I've mailed their customer success team, I've mailed their support team, I sent their CEO a DM and like no one's responding to me, what should I do with this thing? And it's, uh, it, it, it's so frustrating to me to, to hear something like that. Like not um, um, someone getting permission, but just having anxiety about what they do with that type, of, that type of thing. So one of the things we launched this summer was a community cur curated resource for contacting security teams. This is a place where a researcher can go, type a domain name, and if there is an established process for disclosing a security vulnerability, um, it'll come up and, and show you. Like, go to this email address, go fill out this web form. Here's what they want you to do before they submit it. Um, here's what their legal team says about vulnerabilities that you might have found. Um, and I would in encourage you to think about what's stopping you from getting a security app before you start answering the question around getting a bug bounty, if you're in the case of you can't use method number one. And I, I, I'm gonna hit on this a little bit more because it is, it is kind of shocking to me the state that the internet is in right now. We did a survey of the Forbes Global 2000 over the summer, um, hiring people using Mechanical Turk, uh, using multiple uh, consulting firms, trying to answer the question, if you had a vulnerability in this domain, could you find a place to send it to? Um, this is from their help center, we reached out to press teams, we contacted security addresses, and just focusing on the Forbes 100, it is, it, it's sad. There are only 13 companies of the largest 100 companies in the world, if you found a vulnerability in today, they would have told you what to do with it. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, on a, on a happier note, this slide's a little bit outdated. Uh, there's now 14 companies in the Forbes owner because General Motors launched a security at program uh, a few weeks back. So we're down to 86% not having a disclosure program in the top. Um, but this is, this is a frustrating 
uh, to me personally from someone who has um, really been on some undesirable experiences in, in responsible disclosure. And I, I think we need to have a stronger emphasis on fixing this before we get hung up on the should we bounty stuff. Yeah. Uh, th this one or the, the graph? Yeah, it's, uh, it's hackerone.com slash the directory. It's a wiki style. Um, anyone with an account can edit it. Um, there's an audit trail. Um, we ask researchers to, to populate it and keep it up to date. And there's a, a set of moderators that, that do it. So if you um, type the domain name to, to see if it's there yet. It's probably already there. Um, if not, um, it's, it's wiki style, you create an account and, and create it, or uh, just shoot us a note, there's an email list for the moderators, and they'll, they'll create it for you. If it's not already listed and you have a, a, a public contact address. Cool. And so if we expand, I, I, I'm going to harp on this a little bit more in that it is, it, it's kind of sad that people find vulnerabilities today and don't know if they're gonna get sued or not as a, as a result of it. I think we should worry about fixing that. Um, I, I, I plea with a relatively uh, emotional argument every once in a while, then I like to lay, lay, lean on our friends at the FTC with a bit more of a uh, abrasive approach to it. Um, the FTC is one of those few organizations that is actually charged with regulating security and enforcing people who have had irresponsible security practices. Um, they released a summary in, uh, the, again, in the, in the summer of last year around an analysis of all of the enforcements that they've done over the last decade and what were the common trends uh, uh, across them. And one of the ones at the top of their list is the lack of an efficient process to receive and address vulnerability reports. Um, and I would, not gonna dive into the challenges that are here, but I would start with trying to answer this before the, before the bounty question. Yeah. This is about ways in to report. You just said disclosure, right? It's about kind of disclosure approach. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's kind of a, a synonym, right? That whether you call it a responsible disclosure program or a security act. OK, in this graph, we're still calling that a, a disclosure program. It's being disclosed to the company. It's not public disclosure. It's the researchers disclosing to the company that may have a public disclosure policy not to tell everybody. Uh, no, no judgments on that. This is purely disclosure between the researcher and the security team. Um, and for many of these, there is no public outlet on them, like uh, uh, number 12 up there. Oh, right, like that's not a public disclosure program in, in the sense that there's notices for everything that goes out. But there's subsets of products in there that do have CVEs assigned and do have public uh, disclosure requirements. But the majority of the vulnerabilities um, disclosed don't uh, have any type of public disclosure uh, component to it whatsoever. So this is simply the reporting process. And you're right, we should use a different title for that, of just security at programs. But uh, that term's a little uh, even less uh, uh, clear. Um, you won't get a Forbes 100 ranked list. You'd have to plug in one at a time. It's meant to be not a listing of everything out there. It's meant to be a search for a researcher. If I already have a vulnerability in this domain, and I, I'm trying to figure out what to do with it, is the specific use case the directory tries to solve. So it's a search input that looks like this. It's meant to put in a domain name and, or a, a company name and find the result for it. You mean like publish the, the, the data set? There's no rate limiting or anything. People could scrape it. But yeah, we should just publish it in a machine readable format for people to do that. Oh yeah, there's, there's other lists out there that tackle that problem of who pays money for vulnerabilities. Um, we don't do that through the, through the directory. Yeah, uh, thanks, that, that makes sense. All right, um, I'm done harping on, on the lack of security ad addresses on the internet. Sorry, sorry about that tangent. Um, so the second method, if you do not have a security app program and you do not, are not hearing from researchers regularly, um, is an invite-only uh, program. This is not publishing a public method because your organization has um, encountered frictions or roadblocks or unanswered questions around how to run a security app program. Um, and so you can start to gather data in a limited invitation-only bug bounty program. 
Um, it's a pretty low risk method for gathering data. Um, there's no bugs that come in. There's no bounties to pay. Um, because of the unknowns around your response time and the vulnerabilities, um, this is easily paused and aborted. You have tight control over volume, meaning you can say with a high degree of accuracy how many vulnerability reports you're going to get to ensure that you're not taxing any metrics that you haven't defined yet. And the goal coming out of this is to assess the readiness of your SDL for a bug bounty in a particular product or, or service. So let me give you a, an example scenario of what that, what that looks like. Um, the or Oracle is not, but they are in the directory. They have a security app program. Um, are any of the, the findings and the vulnerability findings in these products being found in the Oracle? Vulnerabilities in the, sorry, there are, there's 500 programs that are being run on HackerOne. Um, there is a much larger number of security app addresses, such as Oracle, which are being run um, outside of HackerOne. And that, that should certainly be the case. Uh, but hypothetically, yes. <laughs> so, would you know of any, any of their fixes or penalties because of your, your company's participation? Mm, sorry, I don't, I don't think I understood the question. Let, grab me afterwards and I'll try to, try to pick that apart better. So, uh, this, this starts by setting aside a small budget, similar to what you would budget for a penetration test, and a scoping of one of your more secure applications, one of your most secure applications. You should be looking at those metrics that we talked about in the top three dimensions of where am I getting vulnerabilities, where am I getting reports, um, and where do I have confidence in my response efficiency, um, and target that. Don't use a bug bounty to target this horrible area of your code base that you don't want to touch. This isn't about outsourcing your security. This is about finding the most secure applications that you have and trying to answer the question, is, this, is my SDL here ready for external incentives? Um, and we recommend starting very slow with these. You can do this through a platform pretty cleanly, or if you have external researchers have sent in the past, you can do this manually on your own. Um, invite five to 10 of them. Uh, uh, just a small number of people that you know is, is the recommended range that we start with. And we find that of these, 80% of our customers who run these programs find a new critical security vulnerability in the next 24 hours, and practically all of them find a new one within three days. That's uh, a pretty surprising way. I wanted to always use the uh, uh, three-day one. It was, everybody finds a critical vulnerability in, in three days. And our marketing people were like, no one's going to believe you. It's, uh, it's a lie. You can't say 99%. Can't say you got you to go with the 80% number. <laughs> so we're sticking with 80% in the, in the first day. Um, these programs are incredibly effective at identifying stuff that the rest of your SDL completely missed. There has been nobody out here who's launched a program that didn't find something. Yeah, Alex. Hey, what, what's the sample size? Like how many companies are we uh, For these invitation only ones, it's about 350. Okay, so out of the 350, 80% got, got that critical That's correct. Yeah. But to, to really take a look at this, you're going to want to benchmark your deviation from the key metrics that arise in this program in that that first time period. Meaning you don't need to run these for very long. The goal isn't to run it for a long period of time. It's to start measuring what are you getting in a short period of time to assess whether or not you want to continue the program, scale back the program, ramp up the program, cancel it entirely, and invest in some um, additional areas that, that came out of it. Um, for example, of those uh, 350 and the, the hackers that participate, we see that on average, each hacker is going to find 2.7 vulnerabilities across this, uh, uh, across this data set. If you're running this and you've invited five hackers and each of them found five vulnerabilities, you probably don't want to invite the next five hackers right away. It's time to go back and reassess those metrics and look at why were so many found from external finders instead of all our internal tooling to, to start with. So uh, to give you a sense of what this looks like, Externally, again, we recommend that people start very small in their in their first month and invite just five to ten. Um, we find that overall, uh, in the first month of those 350 programs, we see 22.6 researchers invited. So what this is is cohorting that first batch 
of those 22 researchers and just saying, what if you did nothing? Just invited them and let it run for six months. What is going to happen with the initial incentives set and over the, the six months of time? So on the, on, on the right, we've got the, the blue vulnerability graph. Again, we said you see 2.7 vulnerabilities per researcher. Even though you invited 22 hackers to participate, um, you only get submissions, valid submissions, from 12 of them in the first month. Um, and between all of them, it's about 33 vulnerabilities that come in in those first, in those first 30 days. Um, if we look at month two, this drops off dramatically. If you don't change anything about how you're engaging and you just stick with that first 22 researchers and the same bounty amounts that you started with, um, it drops off pretty quickly. We see a little bit of a spike in month four because we find that for the first people launching these programs, their response time for uh, resolution is usually somewhere between 60 and 90 days, um, which means that in the third month, you start seeing more of those reports resolved and more of those bounties paid out, which is a trigger point for that set of researchers to come back and participate in the program again, or to follow up on things that they found a workaround for. Um, and so you see a little bit of a spike just because you're naturally resolving stuff that, uh, that comes out of this. But by the time you get six months in, you are, from that initial set of 22 researchers that you invited to the program, you're only seeing submissions from about four of them, and they are not finding as much anymore. You have started to exhaust the attention span or the expertise of this set of researchers, and there's a few of these in here that you want to continue to engage with, um, but you are feeling relatively good about using this initial cohort to, answer, to gather enough data to answer the question of, do I feel good about the vulnerabilities that are being founded here? Do I feel good about my response time? Um, and am I finding the, the right type of hackers that I, that I want to engage with? Normally, if you're running one of these programs in, in live, you're gonna have multiple of these points introduced at each set. So like you're gonna run with the first 22, and then by month three, you might decide if these metrics look good, you invite another batch of researchers, and this trend line kicks off again. Um, but what you're looking for here is that your trend line of what you're finding is below the average that you would expect and well within your thresholds for response efficiency. Um, so if you invite, again, those five hackers and they each find five vulnerabilities, your blue line is going to be much higher and there's work to do before you invite more researchers and expand the scope of this program aggressively. This is going to be a very messy slide, but I wanted to... Uh, put some of the data on here for people to look at laughter. This is that same graph, um, but with the, the main things that we track going into it. If you run an invitation-only program, invite 22 hackers, this is what it tends to look like on average with a, a pretty wide deviation for, for the different customers out there. Um, by the end of the six months, you've found 62, or sorry, 76 new vulnerabilities and paid around $37,000 in, in vulnerabilities, uh, in bounties. Again, this trends pretty heavily. If you're someone who only, was only getting one submission per hacker, you're probably going to have a higher bounty amount here and lower bounty average. But just for a sample cohort, this gives you a pretty good idea of what you should expect running a very small invitation-only bounty program over the course of six months. And from this, you should be able to start to answer what areas do we want ongoing incentives. Five minutes, thanks. Um, and so this is what you want the success into to start looking like as time goes on. Um, normally, we don't share these with attribution, but David Rook helpfully tweeted about it, so now I get to be able to, I get to use it in, uh, in slide decks. Um, but, but Riot Games does run a public security app. They have, for, for many years, they accept reports from external researchers. They go through this process of invite a few people and start measuring uh, how, this, how this comes about. Um, and you see their, their response efficiency is right around average, um, but they pay very competitive rewards. Pretty loyal set of um, researcher participation um, and has uh, a significantly larger number of vulnerabilities found than they, than they did in the past. So we've wrapped this thing up. This all starts with your, your SDL. Um, to bounty or not to bounty is answered by looking at your SDL. I view bounty programs as the ultimate measurement of whether or not your SDL is effective in the ways you expect it to be effective. Um, it really helps you benchmark whether or not everything else you're doing is working. If you are relying on bug bounty programs as a source of vulnerabilities that should have been caught by known systems or tooling in your SDL, it's not an effective use of researcher time. You want to leverage this to find those scarce vulnerabilities, not as some more cost-effective way of finding the stuff that should be solved through frameworks and, and SDLs. You want to leverage the stuff coming out of this in a more appropriate way.
So measure what's coming into your, to your security at. Don't start offering incentives right away. You want to track everything coming out of here. This is kind of, kind of ridiculous to, to emphasize so much, but nobody really pays a huge amount of attention to the metrics coming out of their, their security ad address. There's a, a, a few examples of companies who do this well, um, but if you're not monitoring that, you're gonna have a very hard time answering uh, anything else coming out of this. And if you find a bunch of stuff to go work on for a particular product and service after you measure this, it's not time for a bounty program. Feed that back into your SDL. We're all about finding stuff that is going to improve your, your SDL process. Um, but as you repeat this cycle, you're eventually going to start finding things where it's like, for this particular area, we're only hitting diminishing returns. We are not getting what, everything that we want out of our security tooling, and it's time for um, additional testing on it. That's when bug bounty programs are most effective. It is that final line of defense of, I've, I've measured everything else from the outside, and I want to find um, more inputs back into my SDL. I want to know what I've missed, and I need humans to go look for that on an ongoing, reoccurring basis. And that's all I've got for you guys. Anyone got questions running around? Yeah. If you're a, like, let's say you're a product company, but you're also a security company, you're not going to like your product. You don't necessarily have a bug bounty program. You can have like that, and some people look at it. They do have a bug bounty program. Some people look at it back today and don't do it now. I would not do a bug bounty program based on what it looks like. There are a number of companies that will launch bug bounty programs because their security comms person said, hey, other people are doing this, we should go do this too. Um, that is a very bad answer to the, do we bug bounty this or not? I would exclusively use how effective your SDL is as the measurement to should we bounty here? And so the answer to the question is, if you run a bug bounty program before your SDL is ready for it, it will probably look bad. If you are not running a bug bounty program, I don't think it particularly says anything strange about your um, uh, application or the, the security product. What I would focus on is, even if you haven't asked anybody yet, are your customers finding vulnerabilities in the security product? Um, are researchers finding it? Have, have any other been found from the outside? And, and how does that process tie back into your into your SEO. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, we're running a pretty successful bug bounty program, but one thing that we're struggling to do is the bug filters on the service. So after we fix things, they go to the big group. And first of all, it puts our users at risk because they don't have their own filter on them. And also, often the big filters is written in such a way that there is a lot of <laughs> So we're, 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 yeah, yeah. So the, the question is largely, uh, if you run one of these and people disclose stuff, uh, that does that make us look bad and how do we get more control over it? And I, I think you're touching on a, a pretty nuanced point is that it's usually not framed in the company's best, doesn't paint the company in the best point of view. Um, we, we have a much longer discussion around how HackerOne deals with this, but the answer on our platform is we have a very, customizable defined workflow for how public disclosure happens. Um, it is an explicit request that the researcher does to say, hey, I want to publicly disclose this. Here's the date that I'm gonna publicly disclose it on. Um, and the customer configures what their disclosure policy is. Some customers say, there's no public disclosure here for this category of issues. There's, there's no disclosure date for it. Um, and they define that ahead of time in their policy and then enforce it through workflow. Other customers say, we want 90 days head up, heads up, so the researcher, when they go to disclose, is 90 days out, and if they want it shorter, they specifically request an exemption through the workflow in the product. Um, the public messaging of that is a joint communication between the researcher and the individual. Um, there's tooling in, in HackerOne to censor the response, the, the, the timeline to just the activities that occurred, um, to provide an agreed upon summary. I mean, it's usually told with one voice or at least both sides of the story in the same thread and conversation. Um, and so if you look through a bunch of the disclosures on, on, on HackerOne, you'll always see so-and-so requested to publicly disclose this report and the response team agreed to publicly disclose this, this report. And that doesn't necessarily mean the entire email thread is, is disclosed. That's one of the defaults. Um, other times, you'll just see the disclosure timeline in an advisory posted up top, particularly for those that have some type of process. Or anything. 
Um, so the, 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 the story there is you want to have control over your disclosure process. Um, and if you're relying upon, um, if you haven't dis dis defined a disclosure pro policy, you're not going to have any control over your process. And I would start with that first. And then in the ideal case, this is a, a blatant sales pitch, use a platform that has a codified workflow for disclosure <clears throat> so that it doesn't go wrong. And if somebody does do something, like just publish a blog post without giving you a heads up, um, then it's a clear violation of your, of your policy. Um, I was talking more broadly about the uh, disclosure in general, but yes, uh, doing an out-of-band disclosure that does not adhere to your policy would certainly invalidate them from the bounty, but that's not really the, the hammer that stops them from doing that. Um, we, we've done this over uh, 17,000 vulnerabilities. We see a public disclosure requested about one out of every 35 or so. And uh, we have not had a rogue disclosure yet on the platform, where someone was just like, I'm not giving you any heads up, I'm just disclosing this. Um, it is against our terms that we would remove people from the platform that did that. And if you're operating in good faith and saying, here's our, here's our policy that we'd like you to follow for disclosure, um, it goes right far more often than it goes wrong. I'm sure it'll go wrong at one point in time. Um, but the rogue disclosures, when there's a clearly defined workflow for it, um, is, is pretty rare. And that workflow is usually pretty welcomed by the, by the researcher. Yeah, sorry, keep going. Uh, we have, uh, based on average time, have two days to go to uh, So we have, we run a summer software company, and uh, we have around 90 days to see the good product because and the bad things, but we have to fix it over that. So is it a basic timeline? Because you're, you know, called out of that, and that, that security stuff has to explain it well. It's a... Uh, it's subjective, and industry average is misleading. It is a beautiful way to lie with statistics. Um, you need to look at averages across product lines, what they expect in their SDA, SDL, or uh, SLA, and I would start with defining what you think the expectations should be for that product. If you think it's 90 days and you have uh, the 90th percentile is 180 days, you should communicate to those people that we expect to take 180 days here, and if that admission is, is embarrassing to, to you or not what you're happy with, start holding the teams accountable to that and use that as a tool for um, getting better response time there. And you, I think you'll find out that as long as you communicate what the expectations are, um, is a much stronger strategy than whether or not you conform to an industry average or an industry best practice. And because it is going to be so dramatically different for every single product. We have customers that have automobiles on the street that have disclosure timelines associated with them. And the disclosure timeline resolution time for that is very different from how long does it take to fix a simple cross-site scripting vulnerability. Cool. Anybody else? It, it, it depends. Um, so we just did a blog post two weeks ago on um, what the averages look like. Um, I, I can show that to you afterwards. The, the short answer is, on average across the entire platform, um, it's held pretty average about $500 per vulnerability over the last two years. Um, but the top programs on the platform, if you look at the ones that um, have a success index that looks more like this, um, they are consistently trending up. And it's currently above $1,100 average per vulnerability. Um, but the total count of vulnerabilities is significantly down from when they started. And, and that should be the goal. You should be looking for the total number of vulnerabilities that I'm finding is going down, and the total amount that I'm paying for them, or it, uh, amount that I'm paying on an individual basis is, is going up. Cool. All done. Thanks, everybody.